allow anyone in my house to watch that. Because the first thing I say to everybody in the house, if that was your sister, even to women, if that was your sister, your mother, would you want everybody watching that story? You know, the CSI SUV, they said this could be, you know, a real story, but it's been twisted so it doesn't appear real. That's real. They went into somebody's crime folders, mm -hmm. yes. pulled that stuff, and they made a story about that. If that was your relative, do you want people watching that? No. So in the spirit of C. Dolores Tucker, who fought the rap, State Representative Vanessa Brown is fighting this on media. We need to turn off that mainstream media because it is destroying our families and they don't care about you. They don't care. Non-traditional media is who we need to support. And I see they're clapping and, and telling us we got to wrap it up. Just like there's different ways to people how to people how to there's different, 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 different ways to communicate people. There's different ways different ways to communicate people and their different mentality. So I do so I do see hope. hope. I see hope, hope and that's all coming together and understanding each other and learning to and learning to respect. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here today with Alicia Dorsey, the director of Red Hen. Yes. Hi, I'm Alicia Dorsey, director of Red Hen Exploring Our Condition, a five-year documentary exploring issues and concerns. Today we're featuring uh, Mike Gross. He's a motivator and speaker. Additionally, we have Virginia Smith representing the Department of Human Services. Arlene LaRue. Henrietta Hadley. State Representative Vanessa Lowry-Brown. Rosaura Torres. Lauren Schutte. Brian Woods. B. Rock Carter. Hakeem Ali. Myron Hyman. Karen Lee. Thank you very much. And briefly, I'd like to say, I'd like to bring down the negativity that we have about DHS. <clears throat> First of all, we don't drive around in our cars picking up children and throwing them in the back and then going to the next one. Nor do we kick down doors and snatch the children out of the house. If somebody comes into, if DHS comes in and takes your children, then you call the FBI because that's called kidnapping. We do not do that. When we remove a child, it's because we have legal rights through the police. The police remove the children and take them to our building or wherever they belong. We don't, DHS does not do that. We have a lot of resources and materials to help people take care of their kids. Um, currently, the last that I checked, don't quote me, please, it was like 40,000 children in custody, <clears throat> in our custody. We don't want your children. And by, this is today's Friday, by Monday it'll be like 50,000. So we don't want your children. We have resources and materials to help that you can take care of your own children. We have classes, we have um, facilities and facilitators and everything that you need to take care of your own children. In addition to that, I'd like to move on to the domestic violence portion of our segment. Rosa? Yes. Oh. Hello, everyone. I am a survivor of domestic violence, but I'm also an activist. I always call myself the Puerto Rican Al Sharpton. <laughs> <laughs> I am a survivor by police. My abuser was a chief inspector for the Philadelphia Police Department. Not only was I abused, okay. <laughs> by my ex-husband three years after he had left and caused me retinal detachment from the right eye, I met a Pennsylvania state trooper who I named Damien in the book. My reason for writing the book, as I share with this wonderful gentleman at the end, was because I was afraid I was gonna get murdered. I was afraid that no one would really truly know what happened to me. I'm free. I'm free to speak out. Thank you very much, Rosa. Does anybody have any comments on what she said? And also, please, what's the name of your book? Abuse, Abuse Hidden Behind the Badge. That must be very interesting. How long were you with the company? With the? 20 years I was married to the police officer. Oh, okay, that's the behind the badge. Okay, I thought you were there with the police force. Okay, children? I have three adult children. Okay. Yeah. So. I have a question. Yes, Mike. What was 
the reason? What really made you decide now is the time for me to get up and get out? How did you decide that I needed to do something different? Because you said you were married for 20 years. So after being in there for 20 years, what happened that you decided, now I need to fix this, now something needs to change? He left. I'm sorry? He left. May I? Please. Yeah, he, he left. A lot of women who are in abusive marriage and relationships, they blame themselves for the abuse. They feel that they must have did something, and this is exactly how I felt. I felt like I did something wrong. So when he calls me the retinal detachment, instead of getting the help that I should have gotten, I went into hiding. I went into this dark hole, as I call it, and for 10 years of my life, I hid. I hid from him as he moved up in rank, as he was called the golden child of the Philadelphia Police Department. And something inside of me, I lost both my parents. And when my dad died, it was time. It was time to tell my story because it's not only my story. There are so many women, children, and men who have my story, who want to tell their story and are afraid to speak out. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for asking me that question because I can be honest and say I probably would have still been in that horrible marriage. But I am proud to say that my book has won three awards, two in New York and one in Los Angeles to become a movie. Mm. So I'm blessed. I'm here and thank you, God. <laughs> thank you. Well, we had a point back here. Yes. Hi, thank you for sharing that, Rosaria. Um, I'm not a victim of domestic abuse per se, but I am a victim of abuse behind the badge. And my abuse comes in the form of retaliation, harassment, and intimidation by members of the Philadelphia Police Department um, in, in, in the vein that we dared, st 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 we stood up. And um, to make a long, long, long convoluted story short, uh, my son was violated. He made a complaint. And as a result of making that complaint, he's facing five to 12 years in prison. And in addition, in addition to that, I also you know, stood up and I was demoted from my job as being a court reporter for the police department and I was demoted to a secretary. And my point is that you're correct, there is nowhere to go within the police department when you are being violated or abused. So I'm here to, to, to make that known and also to advocate that we have to stand up against abuse in all forms. And um, that's all I wanted to say, thank you. You know, it's extremely important to recognize that an authority figure has been given an authority figure role because we hold them in a place of respect and reverence. We, ex we hold you to a higher standard because you are in that authoritative position. And when you take advantage of that, when you abuse that power, we feel hopeless. There's nowhere that I can really go. What am I to do when the person who I would go to for help is the one person who is causing you the problem in the first place? So it's an extremely complicated and convoluted issue that we can't really just say, you know, one, one fell swoop, we can fix this. There is no just, please, jump in. I, 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 um, well, I was just going to say that DHS's role in this is the children because a lot of this happens to the parents and it reflects on the children. Either they get abused more or also they act out by taking it to school with them. We have uh, domestic violence all the time and um, the children suffer also. It's called like third party trauma and we have um, classes and stuff for them. Also. There's the part of housing and like I worked at a shelter, a rescue shelter, and um, it's really difficult because um, we have shelters and stuff and um, like say if you lived in an eight bedroom home, four baths, and we have you living in this one bedroom with like five of your children, that's really hard to deal with. So the whole family suffers a lot and you're 
income, everything suffers because usually we tell the woman or the, not the woman, I'm sorry, because men get abused too. But we tell the person, the victim to leave their surroundings, their home, their education, their jobs. And we um, protect them as much as possible. As And it's very important that we do. And sometimes when they look at this shelter and they say, you know, it wasn't that bad, <laughs> you know, like, you know, it wasn't that, you know, I can do this. And they go back because they're used to living a certain way and it's all taken away from them. And that's what a victim is. They really are victimized. I beg to differ because they're they're um, confidential. You might not know of them all, and there's different ones for different people. Because I've worked at several. From Women Against Abuse, and I spoke mm -hmm. to the director personally, mm -hmm. there is one domestic violence shelter in the city of Philadelphia. That might be you for might them. You might have shelters right. for other, for other yeah. areas, but when it comes to domestic violence, wasn't it just recently that $3 million was set aside to help expand a domestic violence shelter. Okay, I wouldn't know about that, yeah. but I do know that there are several because we have clients in several different locations. Okay. I must be misinformed. Okay. From, 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 I couldn't and, imagine and a city this, this big. Abuse, that there is one Maybe for their, shelter. maybe for them, whereas DHS does have different ones. For domestic violence? Yes. Really? Now, the important thing in this is much more than whether or not they actually exist, is that people know about them. Yeah. People yes. Know about them. Yes. That's much more important than whether or not they actually exist. So if we only know of the one. Right. That's just as bad as they're only being one. Exactly. And that's, that's where I come in. I have to thank State Representative Brown a million times. Mm -hmm. Philadelphia shied away from me. As a matter of fact, they would rather me just shut up and go away. She opened the door for me so wide that I was able to come and speak at a forum for domestic violence. When I think about domestic violence, I think about, okay, something has to change. Something has to be enforced. These laws are already in place. They must be enforced. We have to look to our judges, our prosecutors, and our lawyers that are in 13th and Filbert or are at You mean um, you want more severe punishment? Oh, heck yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. She just whispered in the side of me, they need to do their jobs. The laws, we have laws. We, a bill was just passed from these states. Of course, the Republicans did not pass the bill, but the bill has been passed that of a domestic violence. It must be enforced. It doesn't matter. When you think about domestic violence, I don't look at myself as a Democrat or a Republican or, or bipartisan or Latina or black or white or Asian. It's affecting all of us. It's gotten out of control. To me, it is a plague. It's a plague that, you know, you turn around and somebody else is either getting raped. I'm gonna share this story with you. A Philadelphia police officer cornered me at my gym. And he said to me, he works for the Special Crimes Victims Unit, he said to me that 80% of the women that go to their unit are liars. Mm. Now imagine how I felt that when he said that to me, and, he, and of course he called me bitter because I wrote the book, I'm like, oh God, we're in trouble. Mm. We're in trouble because we go to them to make sure that we're getting the help. We go to them that, oh my God, someone violated me. Someone violated me, but here is a police officer that finds that we're liars, that we lie about what happened. I didn't lie about my retinal detachment. I have two retinal detachments. I, I do not travel alone. I do not drive anymore. I was a public relations officer. I worked for the Spanish newspaper here, and I am not the same person, but I'm not gonna keep silent. So in regards to enforcing the laws, don't just do it for some, do it for all. 
When you go to court, you want them to do the same thing that they did to the other guy because maybe this rich guy has more money or this guy doesn't have money, but you're gonna, you're gonna punish him more, but you're not gonna punish the rich guy. You understand? So I. How about the ones that were actually abused, not saying they weren't, and they turned their answer around. They say that didn't happen for whatever reason. I don't know if they're threatened or scared, but a lot of them come, and by the time they go through all the stuff that they have to go through, the paperwork, the jury, the judge, and all of that stuff, missing time from work and stuff like that, they might as well, sometimes they say, never mind, forget it. And they turn around and they decide not to um, press charges. And also, a cop, I mean, come on, who would go against a cop? I mean, I'm not, um, I'm not scared of them, but I'm just saying, like you said, if the cop is the one doing the abusing, then, you know, he could do all kinds of things, and then they have this brotherhood to go against them, you know? So they might as well say, just forget it. So I don't think they are lying, as he said. I think they're afraid, they're scared, or either they're better off without all the stuff that's going to happen to them for, you know, telling on it. Their lives really change. Are you referring to a, a survivor? Yeah, I'm sorry, a survivor. Are you a survivor by any chance? No. Okay, that's okay. No, you don't have to apologize. <laughs> You're blessed. Yes. Yes. So many women, children, and men who have been victimized one way. See, people think that domestic violence is just hitting. It's more than that. It's financial. Yes. It's mental. It's emotional. So when we look to a police officer, mm -hmm. they are to protect us, period. I, and I don't want to hear, well, you know, the, the, the brotherhood or the or code of silence or the blue one. I don't want to hear that anymore. I don't want to hear that. What I want to hear is what they're going yeah. to do. Do the right thing for all but, people. Not but just that's then a perfect world. And you got to agree, this is not a perfect world. I mean, I'm quite sure if me and you were cops, I'm just, this is just a scenario. If me and you were cops and you beat up your husband, I'm your partner. I'm not going to say or do anything. I got to depend on you for my life when we're out in the streets. So I'll say, you know, cut it down or, you know, cut it out or, you know, stop it or, you Do know. you know how many women die when you talk like that? I know that. Yeah. I know that. But I'm, yeah. I'm being realistic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm not saying do it. I'm just bringing it out that it yeah. happens. I'm sorry. I'm getting taken. I understand how you can get in terms of, of dialogue like the back and forth. This is a really, 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 really important issue. The point that I want to deal with, though, we sort of ventured into it. I represent a community organization called Reconstruction Incorporated, and we deal primarily with men, women, and children who are in the system and coming home, okay? The reason that I'm here today is because I'm not a victim, okay, and I'm not a perpetrator, alhamdulillah, thank God, but we deal with people who were victims all the time, but from the most devastating end, which is this. The very things that Rosa yes, please. was speaking about, the no help, the points that you raised about maybe the comradeship between the two police that would stop them, not just the police, friends, neighbors, uncles, don't want to tell on their cousins or whatever the case may be. The victim in the end feels that they have no alternative but to do something themselves. So you have Muncie a correction institution that's filled with women that are there because they found no other way to get from under that abuse that they were suffering until that guy went to sleep. And when he was at sleep, they took that knife and they plunged it in him. But the court system doesn't even recognize the fact that that was a mitigating circumstances why that young lady did that crime, okay? All they say is that she took someone's life mm -hmm. or the young brother took someone's life or that child took someone's life. But there are circumstances that lead to it and we're talking about this domestic violence if there is nothing done. So I agree with you wholeheartedly. We need to look past the points that you are raising because that is no code. And what has to happen is that communities, 
communities have to be involved with this. If I live on the same street as Rosa and witness the fact that she was in fact going through that kind of stuff, she don't have to be my relative. She's my neighbor. She lives in my community. My obligation as a man who calls himself a man is to do something for her, if no more than taking her look. I know somewhere where you can stay. You know, I have a house, I have a friend. There's another community here. You can go into another neighborhood. We need that involvement from people who are part of the community. It's an ugly subject, just like incest and everything else. A lot of people don't want to be bothered with it. They um, hear it and they see it and they sometimes, like she said, if it's only one place, they don't even know what to do about it. Is there any suggestions? <laughs> Absolutely. At some point in time, people need to make a decision about if they're going to walk the walk and stop talking the talk. In the community, there are a multitude of things that are happening. You, you have the churches. Uh, this is, and I'm pretty radical with this stuff, and I, 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 re I realize what I'm saying. But you're not going to have a pastor in my neighborhood who's aware of situations like this and just get on the pulpit and talk about God saving them. He has, he is in the community. He, he's taking the tide from those people that are in his church. He needs to step up and speak about that issue. Talk to his congregation about the abuse that's going on in these homes and in his community. You have the legislators, and this definitely ain't about you, uh, th this good sister over there, because she's here. You know, she's here. And, and, and they need to, you know what I'm saying? They need to speak up. Everybody needs to be involved. That's the only way this thing is going to change. Thank you. And, and I'm glad you brought up the pastors, but here's the thing, and, and I'm just going to piggyback with Rosa. I am a survivor of a youth pastor who was abusing me. So they're not going to step up to the pulpit until they get clarification with what's going on with them. Amen. And it's every faith that's dealing with something that they don't want to talk about. So if I come to the pastor, as I did before my husband, my ex-husband was ordained to be the youth pastor, and I said to him, there needs to be a conversation before you allow this man to be the youth pastor of this mega church. And he didn't want to hear what I had to say. So when six years later, I left after praying and doing everything that I was told to do, they wondered why I never went back. Because when I came to the church and came to the women of the church who were also going through it, no one wanted to give me help. So I agree with you. We do need to all come together. One, be true, be clear, be honest, and accept that we have to help our communities. And we have to start from the church, from the education system, from the you know police, everyone. But, but we've got, as adults, I think we have a responsibility to be honest and be truthful. And then we can move on. Yeah. Um how you doing? My name is B-Rod Carter. I have never been through domestic violence, but um, I totally hear what everybody's saying as far as, you know, getting the, get, basically getting the point across, getting it out there. And um, I'm 23. I'm coming up in this generation. I see what's going on with this. And there aren't, there's not a willingness anymore. There's, there's nobody that's willing to take on the authority that's willing to take on the obstacle, that's willing to take on the challenge. If it doesn't include a button, we're not going for it. And, and no, I'm being, I'm keeping it funky. That's exactly what it is. We not, if it doesn't involve clicking a button, we're not going for it. We, right? Yeah. We got, we got, we got social activists on Facebook only, on Facebook. You dig what I'm saying? I'm a ground level type person. I. I, I, I will knock on homes if I have to. I, um, I run a local magazine in the city. So I'm, ta I'm definitely taking all this in. I'm definitely commu uh, community-based. I'm Philly support Philly. So I'm, I'm right along with it. Like you, it takes a certain kind of person to really, to really stand up to an authority figure like, yo, this is not happening. And there, there's certain means that you have to go about doing it to get there. And nobody, the perseverance that goes along with it. No, I'm not saying nobody wants to do it, but it's a long, drawn-out process. Opposition is going to be a long, drawn-out process, and it has to happen in order to efficiently affect change. And, and
different, different issues and concerns. Issues I'm finding, I'm so, finding many, so many different mentalities mentality today. It seems, it seems hard. hard. It seems it challenging. Seems challenging. I don't say hard because the only thing hard, hard, thing hard, hard is behind the creek that we walk on. Everything, everything else, else is a challenge. Is a challenge. challenge. Um, so, 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 I'm ready for, I'm this, ready challenge. for this challenge. And I was built, and I was for, built this. for this. I think that, I think we, that all have we all have a purpose in life. In life. And mine is going to take on a task that most of that most of back away back from. Away from. That impossible. That impossible. So people, people say it's impossible. I see possibilities. possibilities. I don't see anything, I don't see anything as impossible. being impossible. Mentality, mentality, there are different, there are different mentalities, mentalities, but just like, just there's, like different there's different ways to teach people how to read, there's, there's different ways to communicate people, it's different ways, it's different ways to communicate people, people and their mentality. different mentalities. So I do so see I do hope, see hope, I see hope, hope and that's all coming, coming together, together and understanding each other and learning to respect, and learning to respect. This has been incredible. Can we all just take a big deep breath? Can we do that? Can we just, just, just release? Everybody at home, take a big deep breath too. You out there, do it. So again, this has been a really powerful and impactful message. I really first and foremost just want to thank everyone for their willingness to share, their openness, and just for the opportunity to hear your story. Again, as was said previously, anyone going through these particular situations needs to hear these situations. Those not going through these situations still need to hear these situations because there are a community of us dealing with these things. I'm originally from Maryland. I came to Philadelphia to go to college. Uh, I lived in Winfield for a good portion of the time that I was in college. Now I'm driving down 52nd Street one night. This is probably early in my college career, maybe 19 years old. I'm still developing into the man that I want to be. But I'm driving down the street in the middle of the night. It's got to be 1 o'clock in the morning. And if you know 52nd Street, it's a commercial corridor. The middle of the night, the only thing you're going to get is the illumination of neon lights and street lights. That's, that's really all you're going to get in the middle of the night. Now, there were a few cars out in the street. We're all driving up and down past the street lights. We come up to one stop. Um, as I look up, the light turns green. And just before I start to take off, a woman just darts out into the middle of the street. She had this look of fear. This, the death look in her eyes was, it was so intense. And I really didn't understand the situation until a few moments later, I saw this man chasing her. And the look of murder in his eyes. It was so intense in both of them. It was, it really moved me. But then the light turned green. And then me and every other car kept going. Well. I have real shame in my heart about that. I'm still affected by that because I literally have no idea what happened to that woman. Um, that has really colored the way I look at the world. That has really colored the way I look at all women and how I will allow any man in my presence to deal with women. It really impacted me. To the point this woman ran across the street, she fell in front of one of these open store, one of these closed storefronts right up against that metal grate. I'm in my car listening to music. I can still hear the sound of his hand hitting the grate, which was supposed to be her head, but she fell under and cower. If she did not fall down and cower, that would have been her face. And I did nothing. And there was a car, there were cars full of people that did absolutely nothing. So that has really impacted me. And that really brings me back to our talk of community. And that we're all in it together. And that we're all responsible for each other. Now one thing that I always tell people is our feelings, our actions, our attitudes, they reverberate, they, they go out into the world much more than we realize. They ripple out like, a, like in a pond. It just ripples out, it's, it continually affects and goes out and out and out and further out. I really want people to understand that we are in it together. It is extremely important that with something that happens to one person has happened to every person. I apologize. Now if I was a smarter man, 
I would talk about uh, Yuri Bronfenbrenner. He's one of the world's leading psychologists when it comes to human development. And he came up with this theory called ecological systems theory and how the small individual is impacted by their larger environment and the larger environment and then the larger environment. So you're a small child, your family, your school, your church, your community, the world. And each of those small systems impacts the larger system. If I was a smarter man, I'd talk about that. Because I'm not, I want to tell you a quick story about paper-thin walls. 